Good morning, everyone. This is Ariana from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Uh, we're about five minutes out from starting the webinar. We'll start uh, promptly at the top of the hour. So just wanted to acknowledge you all who have joined uh, on time this morning. Please remember to do keep yourself muted uh, to ensure that we don't have any background noise. You're all being muted on entry, but we'll get started in about five minutes. Thank you. Y, 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 um, if you can please make sure to stay muted, that'll help our um, audio quality. So We'll, we'll mute you um, if we hear any background noise, but would appreciate if you can stay muted. Thank you. No.
Okay, good morning. Um, this is Ariana Longley from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, or I should say good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, we are, are welcoming, welcoming you this morning to the Advanced Resuscitation Training, or ART System of Care for Reducing Preventable Death webinar, uh, one of the Patient Safety Movement's quarterly webinars. Um, and we'll have an expert presenter today, Dr. Dan Davis, who's the founder of the UCSD Center for Resuscitation Sciences. Um, so we're gonna uh, get started this morning. So this is just a, a kind of disclosure slide uh, for our CMEs. Um, and so we have some learning objectives for you all uh, to use and apply the integrated approach to reducing preventable deaths, to identify the broad categories of unanticipated arrests, to determine the value and core objectives in cardiac arrest resuscitation, and to recognize the structural, operational, educational, and technological barriers and opportunities to a systems of care approach to resuscitation. So uh, just to get started, um, we're gonna go through some housekeeping. Everyone has been muted on entry. Uh, we do this because we record these webinars and upload them on YouTube later. So in order to keep the integrity of our audio, please do stay muted. At the end, uh, we will have time for a Q&A, &A, and so we will try to open it up for people to speak. Um, there are two options for this. One is you can raise your hand if you are dialed in um, and, and logged in on the web on your browser, you can raise your hand virtually. Um, so there are some directions here. You can click on the raise hand button, which will place a small hand icon next to your name in the participant list, and that would allow us at the end um, to uh, allow you to speak. The other option is if it becomes too loud, um, you can use the chat feature. This is what we're used to using. So please feel free at any time throughout the presentation to leave a comment if it um, generates a question for you and we will uh, acknowledge those questions at the end. Also, uh, this uh, quarterly webinar does allow you to claim CMEs, continuing medical education credits. So we'll be sending out an email from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation uh, after the call on how you can claim that through MedStar, which is our accrediting body. So going through our agenda, um, I'll give a real quick introduction to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation for those of you who are newer to, to our network and joining us maybe for the first time. I'll also explain what our actionable patient safety solutions or apps are. We'll then have 40 minutes uh, of the expert presentation led by Dr. Davis, and then we'll have 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. So the Patient Safety Movement Foundation has a very bold goal of zero preventable deaths. Um, and we believe that zero is the only acceptable goal because one preventable patient death is one too many. And so what we're trying to do is foster new efforts and build on to existing platforms and programs through commitments to zero. So we're not membership-based, we're commitment-based. We want people to take action. So we work with five main groups, so we're gonna run through who can take action. So the first group, um, we'll just stay here, first group is hospitals and healthcare organizations. And so we ask hospitals and those healthcare organizations or health systems to make commitments. Um, and what that means is they share with us publicly what they're doing to improve patient safety, what programs they're really proud of um, so that we can share that and um, kind of bridge the gap ensuring that any information that might be helpful to anyone else across the world can be easily shared um, in a shared learning network. The second group that we work with are committed partners. And the way that I think about this group is anyone who would be willing to wave a patient safety flag should one exist. We wanna figure out what those partners are doing to improve patient safety and uh, work together. So those groups might include professional organizations, societies, other nonprofits working in patient safety advocacy groups, and we ask them to sign a commitment to action letter where they detail out what they're working on um, that's in alignment with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. The third group that we engage with are healthcare technology companies. This makes us pretty unique from other organizations out there. We have a heavy focus on interoperability and what organizations and companies can do to help free up that data. So any uh, company that creates um, a device that could share data, we ask to sign an open data pledge, which says that that company will not willingly or knowingly block or interfere that data sharing piece, and they won't charge on top of the product um, that they're 
uh, manufacturing in order to uh, improve patient safety. The fourth group are our patient and family advocates. One easy way for uh, these, these individuals to get involved is by sharing their story, letting people know that this is still happening and that it should not be happening. Another way is by utilizing resources um, and, and also helping identify resources for us. What do you all as patients and family members know that we can help spread and share with others? And then the, the there we go. And then um, the, the actionable patient safety solutions are apps. We call them APSS for short. We have 18 in total uh, challenges. So those are what you can see displayed here. And then we have solutions under each one of these. So in total, we have 34 solutions addressing these 18 challenges. An example of an actionable patient safety solution that has multiple uh, solutions would be airway safety or medication safety. For airway safety, we focus on unplanned extubations as well as um, just safer airway management. Whereas medication safety, we focus on pediatric adverse drug events, drug shortages, antimicrobial stewardship. So that's how it adds up to the 34. And today, we're focused on the systematic prevention and resuscitation of in-hospital cardiac arrest and the ART program as a way to, um, to kind of utilize and, and, and help improve patient safety in that area. Um, so if you all haven't checked out the actionable patient safety solutions, they are freely downloadable on our website, and we'd encourage you to share them um, through your networks and within your hospitals if that's where you are. So just to share some impact of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation since we were started in 2012, um, we have made great progress getting our organizations, specifically in this case on this slide, hospitals, to commit to zero, to share with us what they're doing to improve patient safety. So we now have over 4,710 hospitals that have made these public commitments to zero. Those hospitals also share with us annually how many lives they believe to be saved um, within their organizations as they make commitments uh, through the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. These numbers are self-reported, so we do not go in and audit them, but we're really proud to say that last year alone, 90,146 lives were saved by the work of these hospitals. And they'll share this information based on methodology um, that they, they have. So if they don't have methodology, we can't claim those lives saved. Uh, we go through a very rigorous process to ensure that we're being uh, very conservative when we report these numbers. So with that, um, we are really excited to have Dr. Davis with us. Um, Dr. Davis is the founder of the UCSC Center for Resuscitation Science. He completed his undergrad training at UCLA, where he was a national merit regent and alumni scholar, as well as a varsity member of the 1987 NCAA National Champion Volleyball Team. He attended UCSC School of Medicine, where he remained for his residency training in emergency medicine. As a third year resident, he was recognized as the UCSC Medical Center House Officer of the Year for the first in his department. During his senior year, he served as Chief Resident and was named Outstanding Emergency Medicine, re re excuse me, medicine Resident. As a resident, Dr. Davis developed research interests in brain injury and resuscitation and was recognized nationally as the 1999 recipient of the Council of Residency Directors Academic Achievement Award. This research interest has been cultivated as a faculty member, and he took a principal role in the San Diego Paramedic RSI trial under the guidance of Dr. Hoyt of the USD Division of Trauma. This endeavor has already resulted in several published manuscripts with others in preparation that together should definitively illuminate the safety and effectiveness of rapid sequence intubation by paramedics in the pre-hospital arena. In 2001 and 2002, Dr. Davis was the recipient of the SAEM Scholarly Sabbatical Grant, and in the current year was the recipient of the UCSD Rosen Faculty Research Development Grant. These scholarly grants have afforded him the opportunity to work with an established investigator in brain injury at UCSD, Dr. Piyush Patel. Dr. Davis was involved in a series of investigations exploring the relative roles of excitotoxicity and apoptosis in ischemic brain injury. He took a lead role on, project, on a project using microarray analysis to identify gene candidates that mediate neuronal ischemic preconditioning. It is anticipated that this line of investigation will lead to sustainable grant support. Dr. Davis received a 2003 Sam Young Investigator Award 
and all sorts of other awards. He's currently the Principal Investigator and EMS Operations Chair for the prestigious Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium. And so to date, Dr. Davis has over 100 published journal articles, abstracts, and book chapters, and serves as the editor of the Difficult Airways section of the Journal of Emergency Medicine. He, currently con uh, he is currently conducting studies using grant support from multiple external agencies, including the NIH, AHA, Department of Defense, Zoll Medical, UC Regents, Carefusion, and Massimo Corporation. Within his department, Dr. Davis has served as ultrasound co-director, medical student director, founder and director of the UCSC Emergency Medicine Research Associate Program, and base hospital medical director. He's currently the UCSC resuscitation director, founder director of the UCSC Center for Resuscitation Science, scientific advisor for Air Methods Corporation, and regional medical director for Mercy Air Medical Services. He's also the principal investigator for the prestigious Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium grant. Perhaps his most impactful work to date has been development of the Advanced Resusc Resuscitation Training or ART program, which we're going to be talking about today, which uniquely links performance improvement data to training to research, to, excuse me, to reduce preventable deaths in the hospital and pre-hospital environments. He speaks internationally on the topics of resuscitation, ventilation, traumatic brain injury, and pre-hospital medicine. So with that, welcome Dr. Davis, and we'll pass it over to you to take it from here. All right, well, thank you very much, and I appreciate everyone uh, logging in this morning or this afternoon or this evening um, to learn a little bit more about what we're doing with the Advanced Resuscitation Training Program. Uh, as Ariana went past the slides, uh, the disclosure slides, it's worth me um, mentioning that I do have a conflict of interest in the wake of the early success of this program, the University of California at San Diego um, insisted that I step out of the university to commercialize this program and uh, offer training solutions as well as consulting. And so that does represent a conflict of interest and it's ultimately what uh, linked me up to the patient safety movement. And so I'll, uh, I'll uh, touch back on that at the very end. Let's make sure I can advance the slides. Let's see, you may have to hand me over control because nothing's happening when I try and there we go. Perfect. All right. So the advanced resuscitation training program is what I would call a system of care. And to some degree, the way it interfaces with the other apps that Ariana mentioned is that it can be an overlay to help facilitate the implementation and ultimately document the effectiveness of each of the other apps. So in that sense, it ends up being uh, a little different in that it's not focused on a particular clinical problem, but instead on setting up what I call, again, a system of care uh, that helps a hospital or an EMS agency take on the other uh, clinical problems represented by the other apps. And so the concepts that we're going to explore is this idea of an architecture or system of care, uh, along with the inputs or efferents, and then the outputs or afferents. And then I'm going to review some of the early outcomes as we've piloted this uh, and uh, established a proof of concept in other hospitals and EMS systems. Now, the development of the program uh, was in some ways generated by ACLS and DLS, which with, well, about which everyone is familiar. Uh, but we decided to take a couple of steps backwards and look at a broader issue of preventable death, which has been um, a hot topic in the last decade and a half or so. Um, and uh, the most recent estimates suggest more than 400,000 preventable deaths per year. Now, I'll give you the punchline, uh, and it turns out that if we backwards extrapolate the number of lives saved at the pilot hospitals for ART, we can prevent almost all of these 400,000 deaths, which is a little bit of a, um, a an optimistic estimate, but uh, as uh, Ariane al already said their goal is zero preventable deaths, and this may represent one strategy to accomplish that. But the idea that we were going to focus not just on the resuscitation of patients already in cardiac arrest, but that we were going to try and prevent arrest, but link that to the same system of care as cardiac arrest, represented a novel approach. 
This is going to become incredibly important as we move forward. This is one of my favorite graphs of all time, which was provided by the United Nations. And the map on the background doesn't represent anything other than a, an interesting backdrop. And so there's nothing about um, the uh, Western Hemisphere on the left or the East on the right. Uh, just makes an interesting and pretty uh, background. But what we see here is the world's population from 1950 and then uh, speculated through the year 2050 and differentiated into those less than age five and those greater than age 65. And for the first time in the history of humans on the planet, we're going to see uh, our species dominated by the elderly. And that has lots of social implications, but from, for those of us in healthcare, that has huge implications with regard to resource allocation and the importance of establishing systems of care and strategies that are not only effective at reducing excess morbidity and mortality, but that are also cost effective, what's now being termed healthcare value. And if you want a reference, we're sort of at the crossing point right now. Um, and so we've got some uh, interesting decades left to come. And uh, for those of us on the call, I suspect uh, we may end up being uh, patients uh, in the year 2050 rather than uh, healthcare providers. Now, so far, our efforts in resuscitation have been mixed at best and disappointing probably for those of us uh, who have dedicated their lives to this. If you look at some of the large databases uh, and if we rely on our ability to resuscitate patients in cardiac arrest, uh, you can see that the largest databases available suggest we're actually going backwards. And there are some rational explanations for this. In out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, the incidence of shockable rhythms with which we have the most success has plummeted in the last 20 years to where uh, less than 20% of initial rhythms for patients in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest are shockable when just 20 years ago it was more than half. And in hospital, we've seen a gradual increase in the sickness of the patients and the age of the patients and the number of comorbidities. So it's not a complete surprise that we don't do as well in resuscitation as, as we uh, perhaps did 10, 20 years ago. But it's been disappointing because we think we're learning lots uh, about uh, cardiac arrest and the uh, optimal ways to resuscitate patients, and yet it doesn't seem to be playing out as an increase in survivability across the board. In 2005, for those of you who've been practicing for a little while, we went through what we call the renaissance in resuscitation, where we focused attention back on the basics, on the classics of good chest compressions and optimal ventilations. But you can see from the title of this paper that we wrote, we did not see this sudden increase or even a, a trend increase in survivability for patients in cardiac arrest following implementation of those 2005 guidelines. In the interim, hospitals have implemented rapid response teams, which represent specialty teams that go out and assess patients who are deemed to be at risk. And the early reviews on these rapid response teams are that they haven't been as effective as we had hoped, and that you can see from the title of this meta-analysis, although they make sense, the robust evidence to support their effectiveness is, is truly lacking. Now, my own path led me through science, and you heard some of the, um, the early experiences recounted by Ariana at the beginning, and it too was a disappointment in that all of our interventions either had no effect or actually decreased survival, uh, which was counter to what I went into resuscitation for. Here you see the cardiac arrest interventions, and on the next slide, the trauma interventions, where nothing we seemed to think was going to revolutionize care had the intended effect. And that's really been the story of resuscitation science, that things that seem to work well in animals or in the lab or even in small clinical trials, when they're ultimately rolled out across the board, haven't had the impact that we've been looking for. And so it's really been a disappointment and somewhat ironic for myself that the biggest impact that I've been able to have is not through uh, the research, but through the implementation of a novel training and a system of care program focused on resuscitation. So this is our logo, and you can see from the motto, people should not die before they are done living, a bit of a, 
a play on words to reflect uh, that not only are we focused on resuscitating patients in cardiac arrest, but preventing premature death, and then even acknowledging quality of life. And just to give you a sense of the effectiveness, this looks at the best available literature on the left for patients in cardiac arrest from around the world, and then the early data from our pilot sites on the right. Um, and again, this is EMS or out of hospital cardiac arrest, but the average outcomes have fully been uh, twice as effective uh, as what we've uh, seen published from around the world. And if we look at in-hospital cardiac arrest, where we have less available data, um, you can see that uh, outcomes for the published literature versus our pilot sites are dramatically different and that we routinely can increase survivability to greater than 40%, even after a single round of the training. In our hospital at UC San Diego, we saw a dramatic decrease in the incidence of cardiac arrest, which we believe is even more important, and that the best arrest is the one that never happens. And that when we piloted this within the University of California system, you can see which of the five hospitals did not implement a prevention strategy, um, and the other four that did with uh, regard to the incidence of cardiac arrest. So what is the secret to this, this success? What are we doing that's different? I'm not even sure that I completely understand, but one of the important concepts behind the advanced resuscitation training program is that we've broken away from the one size fits all approach to resuscitation training. So here you see you know, the same costume, but on two different sized individuals and two different results. The idea that we're going to tailor the training to the institution. And I'll explain what that means and how we develop um, our database and use that to modify uh, the training. But what it first requires is an infrastructure or a system in place uh, that allows you some control over training of other interventions and access to the data that's going to ultimately guide your efforts. The toolkit is what the University of California essentially set me out into the world to uh, propagate. So that's something that we've slowly developed and it has been equally effective at other institutions. That includes even technology. And that, as Ariana said, is one of the things that makes the patient safety movement unique in that they've engaged uh, the, the um, industry of uh, monitoring and, and uh, medical uh, informatics to try and keep them as part of a team as opposed to keeping them separate because they may be motivated um, by profits as opposed to hospitals, which uh, I suppose are probably motivated by profits too, but aren't supposed to be. Um, the training is a clear part of the toolkit. And then the data collection, which I'll explain in more detail in a second, that ultimately all links together in that what happens over time is you create a culture of resuscitation and patient safety uh, that's hard to, uh, to put into a recipe or a formula, um, but it's one of those things where you know it when it happens and it has happened inevitably within even the first few uh, rounds of training. The mission of the program is to prevent preventable death, to resuscitate patients who are resuscitatable and to be able to recognize when futility uh, is, is present and be able to have those discussions with the patient or the family uh, or even the primary team. So that's uh, reflective of the, the motto that patients should not die before they are done living. And I think that's important to keep in mind. The basic model is as a scaffolding, uh, which takes a very broad definition of resuscitation, not just waiting till patients die, but trying to resuscitate and even prevent uh, cardiac arrest. The specificity comes with the specific technology for that institution, the data coming from that institution, the ability to modify treatment algorithms based on performance improvement data and technology, and ultimately influence the content of education and form, uh, the format of education. And ultimately, it's the outcomes that determine whether you're doing it right. And if something's not working, you try something else. We call this approach the enchilada because an enchilada, no matter where you slice it, has some basic ingredients, a tortilla, beans, cheese, maybe a meat or some guacamole on top. And that represents the idea of the inputs and outputs, the afferents and efferents, which 
The inputs could be internal from your own data or external from the scientific literature or even from your technology. And then the things that you do with that, certainly you influence training, launch special projects, uh, and it may beget additional technology. And then the longitudinal aspect of an enchilada represents the path of a patient through the hospital from the initial screening in the emergency department, perhaps through decisions about how to monitor early recognition, the critical care, the cardiac arrest resuscitation, post arrest care, and again, even the end of life discussions. And so when you put that into a grid, it outlines or it maps out the different things that ought to be considered under a resuscitation system of care. And although it seems fairly complex and almost overwhelming, you'll find that almost all of these things are being considered by hospitals as we speak. They're not necessarily new things. They just haven't been coordinated under a single program. And that's, again, one of the things that makes this approach unique. The stuff that we're using for afferents include the data that I'll outline in a second, the idea that it needs to be adaptive to the institution. So not, not every institution can collect chest compression depth today, uh, maybe in five or 10 years, uh, but that we have to be sensitive to the resources available in each hospital and the culture in each hospital, but that we gently encourage an evolution towards uh, what we think is the ideal. And so that's the balance point between adaptivity and evolutionary. Uh, and then all the analytics that help you analyze the data. And so these are the data that we uh, collect. Uh, the term DECO stands for data, database to enhance uh, clinical outcomes. And it plays off the, the idea of art. Um, but the kind of data that we collect on patients who have had some sort of an event, whether it's a um, cardiac arrest or even a rapid response activation, the demographics, the events that were happening upstream of the incident, if it was a cardiac arrest, intra-arrest of um, data, including things like chest compression, depth rate, recoil velocity, things that very few hospitals are currently collecting, but hopefully one day will. Uh, if the patient survived, then post-arrest care, any process issues that uh, were identified during the event. And then ultimately, we follow the patients clinically and try and make some determinations that you'll see in a second. This is another way of looking at the same concept where there's a vent, we have primary database entry and a, a review. Sometimes we have to react to a specific case either through the debriefing, which we try to do every single time, or even communicating to the leadership of that unit or risk management, hopefully not too often. But then we include the data in a database that's used in combination with the emerging science to give a big picture response, which may include changes to our algorithms, uh, changes to training, and then ultimately launching special initiatives if we see a particular pattern that's concerning. This is a more complex version of the same thing that shows where we're getting the data and then what we do with it specifically, but ultimately it's the same concept that we're collecting certain data surrounding each event, combining it with a clinical interpretation and then feeding it back either on a case specific basis or in some sort of summary that we're using to guide decisions about the program and also to, to uh, benchmark and, and give us a dashboard for the, the leadership of the hospital. So this just represents a basic CQ, CQI loop, but it hasn't really been done effectively in the resuscitation arena previously. And this is a lot of what makes the program effective. And I'm going to show you how we use this data as we go forward here. And what we do with it, again, we have to be sensitive to what each institution has available. So not everyone has access to a simulation center. Not everyone is moving towards online training. Sometimes uh, it just defaults back to a standard life support training uh, class. So adaptivity, being able to adapt to the curriculum to each institution is an important piece. And ultimately, we can get down to adaptivity at the unit or even the specific provider, providing remediation for individuals who are struggling or addressing different topics for different units in the hospital, depending on what patterns that we're seeing. We adapt the curriculum to our performance improvement data, to the technology that's available, and we try to be flexible with regard to the format of training. I'll show you the modularity in a second, but the idea that you have 
a broad um, swath of, of training materials to choose from, and then the paradigms that we use for different aspects of resuscitation, which again will make second, more sense in a second, but reflect my bias towards cognitive psychology. And that brings up how we teach, not only with regard to the adaptivity, um, but even the format so that um, different classes are held in different locations. Part of that is a nod to trying to be cost effective and get the most out, our, out of our resources with the assumption that we only have a certain amount of resource available. So let's make sure that it counts and make sure that it's effective. And then again, this idea that we need to get inside people's heads and figure out what is it that's gone wrong with training in the past and how can we improve on that and ultimately use our data to demonstrate that it's effective. The idea of a modular curriculum, this is our barn, uh, which looks like a custom built barn, but if you look from the backside, you see that it's just panels that were assembled in a factory somewhere and are made and pieced together to meet our individual needs. Very much like the curriculum that I'm describing, where you may have an infinite array of training materials available, uh, but that here you're seeing a very specific con construct of a curriculum for airway management that takes pieces of the curriculum, integrates with cases, and ultimately puts them together either for new hires, for recurrent training, or even remediation. And that it's that modularity uh, that provides some consistency, but also um, the adaptivity to address very specific needs. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the curriculum and you can see how broad of a definition of resuscitation we're using. So in addition to the traditional cardiac arrest, where the paradigm we use is called CPR Island, and I'll show you the algorithm in a second. We also have modules on arrest prevention, on critical care, on airway management. So we're trying to cover the most vulnerable areas of the hospital and, and resuscitation in general. From the standpoint of the individual, instead of taking four or five or 10 or 12 different courses, they're taking a single course that's addressing different needs based on where they work and the problems that we're seeing. And so I'm gonna introduce you to the paradigm behind each one and then show you the effectiveness. So the paradigm to try to re reduce preventable death, which is probably most relevant to the discussion today, we call the theory of everything, which the movie version um, documented Stephen Hawking's attempt to describe the universe with a single equation. So for us, that was a single um, representation of how patients die in the hospital. So if what we're trying to prevent is the cardiac arrest, we identified four physiologic pathways into cardiac arrest. A circulatory arrest, which is a drop in blood pressure, a dysrhythmic arrest, which is exactly what we describe, a respiratory arrest involving a drop in oxygenation, and then uh, rarely a primary brain injury leading to herniation and a neurologic uh, arrest. These four patterns were then used to generate the materials to teach people pattern recognition at the bedside, um, as opposed to simply memorizing thresholds or calculating scoring systems or using proprietary algorithms, but instead trying to foster uh, clinical judgment um, and, um, and account for the, the decreasing level of experience by many bedside providers. If we take it a level up, we identify different diagnoses or clinical conditions that produce each of these things. So for example, drop in blood pressure could be from bleeding, from sepsis, from trauma related things like tamponade or congestive heart failure, whereas a respiratory arrest could be from underlying lung disease or even an obstructed airway from a narcotic administration. And so these become the guide for the data collection system and I'll show you how that works in a second. We can even anticipate these things by looking at risk factors for each of those clinical conditions. And that when you put all of this together, it becomes a data roadmap for identifying patients at risk and then identifying the early signs and symptoms of deterioration. Now the nurses generally wanted some specificity. They wanted to know that this was true and that was really happening before they called for help. So we added what we called AIM and then SHOOT. AIM was to try to drill down to make sure that this is real and not just some sort of random noise in the system. And then SHOOT was to try and reverse the deterioration. 
So when considered together, this theory of everything becomes a roadmap for all things related to patient deterioration in the hospital. And you can essentially map out the apps from the patient safety movement into this grid, as well as our data collection um, and, and even the intervention and protocols uh, for our rapid response team. For cardiac arrest, we define an, an algorithm of CPR island, the idea that if a patient's in cardiac arrest, you take them to CPR island and that there are only two reasons that you would leave the island to actually deliver a shock or be a reperfusion. Um, so a very simple algorithm, but that starts to get complicated uh, for the code leader when you integrate some of the technology like entitled CO2 and CPR feedback. So the simplicity uh, is, is greatly appreciated. For each institution, then you fill in some of their blanks with regard to their specific protocols, which even the American Heart Guidelines do not necessarily tell you for sure whether you should or shouldn't use EPI um, and how you should do your compressions and ventilations, but give you several options. And so this allows us to adapt the algorithm to each institution. For critical care, we use this balancing act of perfusion, oxygenation, and ventilation, the idea that critical care is a constant risk-benefit analysis balancing different physiologic processes. And our airway management algorithm, which looks fairly complex, but actually becomes much simpler once you understand the different tiers and the different branch points, uh, has been used successfully for anesthesia, for emergency medicine, and for flight crews uh, out in the field. This is the idea of a modular curriculum, the idea that you're in a shopping center or a supermarket and you go down the CPR aisle and pick out some materials regarding CPR depth and maybe some, some um, skills sessions and simulations, and that you can assemble a curriculum for each type of person in the hospital or each unit based on the perceived needs, uh, which are often being driven by um, the data collection. Um, and that includes different slide sets, that includes uh, video materials, um, and that includes even uh, little vignettes that try and uh, bring some light to the situation, even though it's a fairly heavy topic, um, because we found that these discordant images are often more memorable um, because they are so different than, than the topics that they're addressing. So here you see the god of ventilation giving some guidance to a guy who holds the bag and squeezes it too long. Um, increasing intrathoracic pressure in the process. We try and integrate uh, more sophisticated tools to guide CPR, whether that's solely during training like this mannequin, or in real time, like you see in the defibrillator on the left, um, giving you real-time feedback. We found it takes some specific training to be able to integrate that effectively into clinical practice. And then ultimately simulation, which Many, but not all, hospitals uh, now have access to, um, but need to be integrated with the curriculum to ensure that the core concepts are being um, underscored and, and uh, reinforced. All right, so let's look at the outcomes, which uh, hopefully will convince you that this sort of an approach uh, is potentially one solution uh, for the problem of, of untimely patient death and appreciate the magnitude of the changes in outcomes, the consistency across different institutions, and I'm going to show you how it aligns with some of the other quality metrics, including pay for performance. So here you see UCSD's initial graph of the etiologies of cardiac arrest, which if you look at the etiologies included here, they map out to our theory of everything, which represents that integration of data collection and the, the uh, clinical training. We decided to target these three initially uh, as ones we thought we could reduce. And so that gives us a little bit of a roadmap. And then you can see from the first year to the second year that in some cases we were effective and other cases not so much. And so the process of running a system of care in resuscitation and uh, arrest reduction involves constantly looking at your data for the low hanging fruit for the opportunities to then go back and try something different. For cardiac arrest survival, these were our initial uh, survival rates. Uh, after the, or we decided we were gonna target these vagal events as well as respiratory arrests. And after the first year, we saw improvements in most of the areas, 
uh, but we actually saw the VFib VTAC uh, survival rates go down when we went to a one shock at a time approach that the uh, American Heart Guidelines advocated. So this represents a change then in our algorithm where we went back to stack shocks for monitored or witnessed arrests, continued to reinforce the other concepts, and after the third year, uh, we saw survival go back up with VFib, continue to improve or maintain in the other areas. So again, a very simple CQI loop, but it hasn't really been done uh, in the area of resuscitation before. And together, that led to a dramatic improvement, not only in arrest survival and a reduction in arrest incidence, but as you'll see in a second, an actual reduction in overall hospital mortality. We can get very specific. So in this case, we're looking at chest compression fraction, a very specific element of CPR before and after the program. Or in this case, in a group of emergency physicians and nurses, looking at the percentage of chest compressions with the optimal rate and depth, which at baseline was very poor, but then after the training uh, went to nearly 100% for most patients or most uh, providers. The survival from cardiac arrest in our hospital continued to ratchet up and up, um, but was already ahead of the national average to start. So this isn't necessarily just for hospitals that are struggling, but that everyone has opportunities for improvement. And that overall mortality decreased by about 25%, which is very exciting, not only because that represents a quarter of the patients who die in the hospital, but also for the hospital's sake, because now mortality is part of the formula for Medicare reimbursement. It meant literally millions of dollars coming back to the hospital. And that UC San Diego, as compared to the other UC hospitals, had the best performance when we first started this program uh, almost a decade ago uh, in the wake of the program implementation, but also the fastest rate of improvement as opposed to the sister institutions. And that within the state of the California, we had the lowest uh, mortality index or risk-adjusted mortality, which again is now tied to Medicare reimbursement. And then across the country, as part of a, a database, um, we went from kind of middle of the pack to one of the top five performing institutions with overall quality. And as we've piloted this in other areas of the country and other types of institutions, we've seen remarkable consistency even after the first round of training with regard to arrest survival. Here you see one particular hospital um, as they go year over year, increasing their survival to discharge. Here's an EMS system in Northern Colorado with the same sort of pattern. And here's a hospital in Louisiana, uh, which was able to reduce the incidence of cardiac arrest uh, by layering this curriculum on top of their rapid response program. And then we can get very specific with certain techniques, in this case, uh, intubation success among flight nurses and paramedics, whose success rates, even under the worst conditions out in the field, mostly with trauma patients, are actually higher than the success rates for anesthesiologists in the operating room. So this will be the last slide, just kind of describing the process of implementing a program like this. And uh, this is something that we're certainly willing to help you with, and you can contact me. I'll give you my email address in a second here, or, or reach me through uh, the patient safety movement in Ariana. But I really just want to encourage hospitals to start thinking about this kind of system of care or a programmatic approach to resuscitation, uh, where we have this architecture that links together data and training and brings in technology and the scientific literature and creates a, an organized system of training materials to address any problems that arise. And that includes the slides, the videos, skill sets, simulations, all of these things that we've been talking about. The database and analytics to not only document the effectiveness, but also provide a roadmap and identify opportunity areas. And there are now increasing number of consultants available to help with this process or actual training um, available to, to uh, get you started. And that's something that I'm willing to help with. And I hope as we move forward, there will be a growing community of hospitals and EMS agencies that are taking this on and breaking from the traditional approach to life support training and encouraging each other and sharing ideas, which we would call uh, a community. So that's the last slide that I have, and I'll, I'll hand it back over to Ariana and, and her crew 
uh, to help field the questions, but just so that you have my contact information, my email address is my name, Daniel Davis, MD, all one word with no underscores or periods or anything, just Daniel Davis, MD at gmail.com. And so if you have any questions or if you want some additional information, or I don't know if you have access to the slides, but I'm certainly willing to provide the slides uh, if that's something of interest to you. So thank you very much for sticking with me to the end here. And Ariana, I'm going to hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, what a wonderful presentation. And obviously, we can tell that you're so passionate about this. And it's been fantastic to see the outcomes um, from being able to implement this. So um, I hope everyone else on the line has found as much value as I have in um, absorbing this. We do have about 15 minutes for uh, questions. Um, and so we did just receive our first question through the chat box. Remember, please feel free to uh, send your your questions through chat, or if you'd like to raise your hand, um, we'll be looking for hands to be raised. So the first question comes from Jennifer Johnson. She asks, what strategy was used to repurpose staff ACLS, BLS, PALS training dollars to fund this program? So we had sort of a, a fortunate um, occurrence that at the time was seen as disastrous in that um, the same month that the American Heart Association came in and saw what we were doing, which was originally under the banner of ACLS and DLS, um, but that we had tweaked, um, which uh, I found was not necessarily welcomed with open arms, uh, that they came in and said, you know, you can't do this and call it ACLS and DLS because you're know, giving a card that certifies that somebody took this class. Uh, means that they took the class that the American Heart Association you know, sent you and not your own version of that. And although they understood my efforts to improve outcomes and were impressed with the outcomes, that ultimately you couldn't call it ACLS because it had become so different. Um, and so we thought that that would shut down the whole program because who wouldn't have ACLS and BLS as the core of their hospital certification process? Well, then the Joint Commission came in um, a couple of weeks later and saw a resuscitation and saw two groups of people, one who had been trained by the local AHA um, outpost and one who had been trained by our program, which didn't even have a name yet, and saw a dramatic difference in their level of competency and their comfort and their, and their uh, awareness of, of what was going on during the event and ended up learning about the program and anointing it their best practice model, which now is called their good practices database. And so it was the joint commission that told us, you, know, you need to keep doing this, you need to expand it into all your clinic areas, and you need to try and get other hospitals to follow this sort of a model. And so that's all our hospital needed to hear in order to say, okay, from this point forward, we're going to take all the dollars that we were spending on ACLS and DLS and reallocate those towards this program. And that was the way it was presented back to me as you can use the same pot of money. One thing we found is we didn't have any idea how much was being paid because a lot of folks were out there taking classes and then submitting their receipts for reimbursement from their units. So my big mistake was I ended up showing that you could do this for what I thought was the ACLS BLS PALS budget it turned out to be about 25% under budget once we finally got all the returns, but once you show you can do something for less, you'll never get that money back. So for us, there was a very distinct flipping of the switch, and it wasn't until later that we realized how much the hospital was recouping with regard to um, pay for performance reimbursement or the other uh, big area that we were, were saving money with this program was in uh, medical legal expenses because the University of California is self-insured and that our payouts were reduced by 95% in the wake of the program. So it was an easy sell for our hospital because we had the joint commission saying you need to do this and then all of the, uh, the um, financial incentives came later. I have found going forward that about half the hospitals are brave enough to say we're gonna do something besides traditional life support training and they're willing to make a swap and others that want to use this sort of training as supplementary, that they want everyone to take the basic you know, life support training and then use this to train specific people like the code team members or 
to use it as sort of reinforcement of the core concepts because the core concepts are not dramatically different than what is taught within ACLS and BLS, but it's really a more effective strategy. And then we go much broader uh, in covering the prevention aspects as well. Um, so if you're looking for more specifics for your institution, then again, contact me because it helps once I kind of know what type of institution it is, and then you can get to you know, what really motivates the institution to want to make a change. So my, again, my address is danieldavismd at gmail.com. Great, thanks, Dr. Davis. Um, we have two more questions. Uh, next one's from Jean McCarthy. She says, if I heard correctly at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned a decline in shockable rhythms over some period of time, but I didn't catch the reason for this. That's, that's a good question. Uh, that mostly applies to the out-of-hospital arrest population, where at least two dozen different cities or EMS agencies um, have documented that in a 10 to 20 year period, the incidence of ventricular fibrillation as the primary arrest rhythm has gone from more than 60% uh, down to our most recent data, less than 20%. And we think that that has to do with patients being more aggressive in going to the emergency room when they have an elephant sitting on their chest. Uh, it may have something to do with the increased use of medications like beta blockers, which reduce the likelihood of somebody flipping into ventricular fibrillation. And in some places, um, the response times have actually gone up for certain patient populations. And the longer you wait, the more likely V-fib, um, if you were there in the first few minutes, becomes PEA or asystole. But that's really a function of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. For in-hospital, it really depends on what types of patients you have. And we saw a spike in the incidence of our V-fib arrest rate when we opened a cardiovascular center, um, which attracted some of the sickest patients in San Diego County to our hospital, but also then um, gave us a different risk profile and we saw an increase in the uh, V-fib arrest rate um, along with the increase in, in patient volume. Great, thanks for answering that question. Next question is from William Schneiderman. He said, Dr. Davis, thank you for an excellent presentation. How were you able to capture your EMS agency and EMS providers' interest or captivate their attention in patient safety? Do you have a suggestion or two for captivating this group's interest in patient safety and their commitment to patient safety in the pre-hospital arena? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, and that's at the essence of my belief in cognitive psychology, which I use as shorthand for the idea that what I think is broken in current life support education is this idea that you need to capture people's imaginations and their passions before they're gonna be receptive to anything else that you have to say. And you have to convince people that this is more than just a regulatory requirement to take this training, but that people's lives are at stake. And I will use anything, this is sort of an end justifies the means uh, kind of approach. I'll use anything to try to capture people's uh, spirits in this sense. I found that deep down, most providers really want to have an impact, but that they've been burned for so many years of seeing, you know, the guidelines flip and flop or seeing the outcomes haven't improved, that they're reluctant to actually put any hope in this training. And so making them feel like they're part of a movement, showing these other outcomes and saying, you know, these are real people that are going home to their families. And I'm not above using anecdote, which has been kind of discouraged in the traditional ACLS, BLS classwork. But if you can use anecdotes to illustrate something very specific, whether it's the impact of, of this training um, or the impact of one specific um, point that we're trying to emphasize, it tends to bring people around and they're reluctantly willing to give you a shot and see if it works. Now, one eerie Coincidence, every place that we've gone has had a very high profile save within days to a week of, of the training, and that suddenly everyone sees this as something different, something new, and that's the best thing that can happen to an institution is to have people see it as something different, not just the same old thing that changes every five years, and if you wait long enough, we'll go back to what you were doing you know, when you first learned 20 years ago. Uh, but that's a lot of my own focus, and it calls on my undergraduate degree in psychology. 
um, to try and, um, and get people to, to, to believe in the system uh, and reinforce that and then increase their receptivity to what you have to say. Great. Thanks, Dr. Davis. Um, that concludes the chat questions that we had. Um, if anyone would like to try to take themselves off of mute, if you have any questions, um, I don't see any hands were raised, but we do have about six minutes left. Um, so I'll just pause. Please feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question and you can speak up. Okay, I haven't heard anything, so we'll just move on to our last slide. Um, so I wanted to remind you all that we have uh, one of our two main meetings of the year, Tuesday, September 17th. Uh, which is just in a few weeks here, um, and it's on World Patient Safety Day. It'll be here at the University of California, Irvine. We have a few spots left. It is free registration, so if you'd like to join us, um, you are more than welcome. Our next quarterly webinar will be in December. We haven't set the date or the speaker yet, so stay tuned for that. And our World Patient Safety Science and Technology Summit, our big event of the year, is coming up March 5th through the 7th of 2020, also in uh, Southern California, Huntington Beach. It'll be lovely here in March, maybe snowing in other parts of the country, but hope that you can make it. Um, I did notice that there was one more question that came in from Jennifer Johnson. So since we do have four minutes, um, I'll, I'll repeat this to you, Dr. Davis, and see if we can get one more in here. Um, before we close. So Jennifer Johnson has asked, have each of the facilities that you've worked with developed their own unique database to study their cardiac arrest data? So um, we developed, a, I developed a database in Excel with a lot of formulas and things. And um, our grant within the University of California was to test that database across the uh, five sister institutions. Um, and focus on data collection with some of them also doing training like I, I showed you, but not that wasn't necessarily part of the of the grant. And so we've refined it and we have it as a kind of tiered program where initially the focus is on just capturing the events and trying to categorize the etiology of arrest. And then as time goes on, trying to become more sophisticated either with regard to CPR data or um, some of the, the uh, actual performance data um, from the team that was uh, involved with the resuscitation. And so we've sort of refined that database and our next step is to put it into a format um, that you know uses all the right firewalls and, and uh, is in the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. So we're hopefully close to doing that. In the interim, the hospitals that are participating in our pilots are using my original Excel spreadsheets but they're keeping the data locally because we don't have all those firewalls and, and, and all of that. So they provide to me summary data so we can look at how they perform relative to each other, but they're keeping the data using our Excel spreadsheet and our manual of operations and data definitions. They're keeping all of that locally. Great. Thanks, Dr. Davis. And thank you everyone for your questions um, through the chat box. Um, with that, I think we'll close for the day. So, Dr. Davis, again, thank you so much for your passion and knowledge around this area. Um, it's been a, a wonderful quarterly webinar topic for us to focus on. And so, uh, remember, for those of you who want to claim CMEs, we will be sending out an email in the next day or so, and we'll be uploading this onto YouTube so that if anyone would like uh, to share it um, with colleagues or uh, absorb it again later, you'll have an, uh, access to do so. I've also shared Dr. Davis's email in the chat box um, if anyone was looking to email him. I know you've mentioned it a few times. So um, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day, and we look forward to hopefully having you on our next webinar in December. Take care.